Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Campbell, and I'm here today to talk about a project that I'm currently working on for the GNOME Foundation, a new accessibility architecture that we are designing and implementing for GNOME and eventually other free desktop environments as well. Or in other words, modernizing accessibility for desktop Linux. So let me give a quick overview of some key terms and concepts in accessibility. When we talk about accessibility, we're talking about making applications accessible to disabled people who depend on assistive technologies, such as screen readers, alternative means of input, such as speech recognition and screen magnifiers. Those are the three main categories of assistive technology, or AT for short. The way that these ATs access applications is using interprocess communication, or IPC, between the application and the AT. Now, on, uh, on several platforms, the actual IPC mechanism is hidden behind an accessibility API. Um, on GNOME and the free desktops in general, the IPC is a published uh, standardized protocol with multiple uh, imp implementations. A key concept in accessibility is the accessibility tree. If you're familiar with the HTML document object model, or DOM, it's a similar concept. Um, you have a hierarchy of nodes starting with the application window, typically as the root. Uh, you might have uh, layout containers such as GTK HBox or VBox objects in the tree. And then uh, you have uh, typically uh, text labels and controls such as buttons, checkboxes, sliders, etc., as your leaf nodes. Now for some more uh, complex controls such as text edit controls, the, uh, the control might have child nodes such as the individual lines or spans of text. And the application, or again, in, in practice, the, uh, the UI toolkit um, that's implementing the accessibility support will emit events such as when the keyboard focus changes, when the text caret or insertion point changes, when the text selection changes, etc. Let me give a little overview of the history and current state of accessibility in GNOME and the free desktop world. So the key protocol here, which implements, which defines how to do the IPC that I was talking about, is called the Assistive Technology Service Provider Interface, or ATSPI, which I will pronounce as ATSPI for brevity. ATSPI was first implemented for the GNOME project by Sun Microsystems starting in 2001, originally using the CORBA distributed object framework. It was ported to DBUS for GNOME 3 starting in 2008, as GNOME itself was moving away from CORBA. And unfortunately, uh, the uh, GNOME accessibility stack and therefore free desktop accessibility in general has been under-resourced for 10 years or more. Um, unfortunately, the original GNOME accessibility team was one of the casualties of Oracle's acquisition of Sun Microsystems. Um, but um, I do want to give a shout out to a, a couple of the people that have been maintaining uh, the accessibility stack uh, in the meantime. Um, particularly Joan Marie Diggs at Egalia, who has maintained the Orca screen reader for many years, and Mike Gorse, uh, who works at SUSE and has done a lot of great work on the AtSpy uh, core uh, libraries. But there are problems with AtSpy, uh, particularly um, as the free desktop ecosystem has been changing in recent years with the rise of the Wayland uh, windowing system and um, sandboxing, uh, security sandboxing technologies such as Flatpak. One general problem with AtSpy is that there's no direct connection between the AtSpy accessibility tree and the windowing system. So that means there's nothing saying that this node in the accessibility tree is coming from that 
X window or Wayland surface. They're just kind of running in parallel and disconnected from each other. And so one consequence of that is, is that uh, the, the AtSpy accessibility model uh, assumes uh, trusted applications. So for instance, when an application emits an event saying that it has the focus, the keyboard focus, then assistive technologies such as the Orca screen reader pretty much have to just assume that that's correct. They can't verify that, the, uh, that that event is actually coming from the application that currently has the focus. And so this and other factors amount to the, there being no support for, sandbox, for fully strongly sandboxed applications using technologies such as Flatpak. Um, you could, you could still partially sandbox a flat pack application, but you'd have to open a pretty big hole in that sandbox to let it connect to the AtSpy uh, message bus via Dbus in order for that app application to be accessible. But in my opinion, at least, there is a deeper problem with AtSpy, um, and that is what I will call the problem of chatty IPC or inter-process communication. And what I mean by that is that uh, in order for a screen reader or other assistive technology to respond to an, an application event or a user command, it doesn't immediately have all of the information that it needs locally. It has to keep going back and forth and doing multiple IPC round trips to uh, query all of the information that it needs. And it's bad enough that AtSpy actually has its own instance of the Dbus message bus, because if that, all of that IPC was happening on the Dbus session bus, then it would uh, degrade uh, performance for all of the other things in the desktop environment that depend on the session bus. But this problem actually exists to varying degrees in other platforms as well. So it's not just a problem with GNOME and the AtSpy protocol. And it, it's a problem that has gotten me um, fired up uh, for, for quite a while now. I used to work on the Windows accessibility team at Microsoft where I developed, where I, I helped develop the, uh, the narrator screen reader and the UI automation API. And uh, the, the manager that first hired me on that team probably still remembers some of the discussions that we've had about the IPC problem. So why is it a problem? Well, hang on, hang on. I think I, uh, okay, I, I am still in sync with my slides. Um, so one, one reason why this is a problem is that the latency of those multiple IPC round trips adds up. And I'm, I'm going to talk about an instance where this was a problem in Windows in the narrator screen reader, simply because that's, that's, the, that, that's the thing that I know the most about. But uh, I'm, I'm, I, I know that, it was, that it's a problem for, uh, for screen readers, for, for things like Orca as well. Um, but in narrator on Windows, we had a problem when I first joined that team in 2017, where if you were doing a continuous read through a document or a web page or an email, just letting the screen reader read the whole thing aloud to you from beginning to end, the reading was choppy. And it would, and before we implemented workarounds for this and, and made it smarter, um, the reading would just, uh, um, be interrupted at you know, random uh, places in the text because the way that, that the way that we had to implement the continuous reading operation in Narrator, it would uh, require multiple IPC round trips uh, per word of text to find out where the words were, to uh, find out the bounding rectangle of each word so we could highlight it and other things. And um, while I, I'm, I don't believe that Orca has this exact problem, that might simply be, and I, I, I have to admit, I don't know all the history here, but uh, that might simply be that Orca designed around this known uh, limitation of the, uh, of the protocol. But we shouldn't have to limit the features that are provided in screen readers and other assistive technologies because of the, uh, the design of the protocol. And
And the, the latency issue is partially mitigated by caching uh, features that are built into uh, AtSpy and in, in the case of Windows into UI automation. But that's only a partial solution. And in particular, in, in both of these protocols, um, it doesn't cover all of the things that you want to be able to do with text. Another problem is that this IPC is often bottlenecked on the main thread of the application, um, waiting for that thread to respond to, uh, to, to, those, uh, to those queries. And if the main thread is busy doing something else, then that means that uh, screen readers in particular feel uh, that that application feels unresponsive when a blind person is using it with a screen reader in a way that it doesn't feel unresponsive to a sighted person. And that leads me to a broader point, which is that this approach to IPC in accessibility protocols leads to unequal access, one, one cause of unequal access for blind users as compared to what sighted users get. Because if you think about the, the main thread bottleneck that I was just talking about, it's kind of as if when, whenever the application was busy, it's as if the screen went blank um, before, un until the application started responding to events on that main thread again. But no, that's not what happens. A sighted person can continue to look at whatever was last drawn on the screen and, and see what's there and make, make their decision about what they're gonna do next when the application is ready for them again. Um, another, another thing, um, another reason why I say this is a cause of unequal access is that, as I said, the, the features that are available in screen readers and other assistive technologies can be limited based on having to work around the, uh, the IPC latency. So let me introduce the project that I'm working on code named Newton. No, not the 1990s PDA from Apple. This is a new Wayland native accessibility architecture. It's called Newton because I decided to go with the old convention uh, started by Wayland itself and some other Wayland projects such as the Weston reference compositor of uh, naming after places in New England. In this case, uh, the Newton Project is named after the town of Newton, Massachusetts, which is where the Carroll Center for the Blind is located. And this, this new architecture is designed from the beginning for untrusted applications. As one example, um, the application indicates which, which uh, component or node within the accessibility tree for its Wayland surface has the focus, but it's up to the compositor to tell the assistive technology which Wayland surface or which application has the keyboard focus. We don't trust the applications to provide that information. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later. And the way that I am dealing with the chatty IPC problem is we don't use the pull model where the assistive technology keeps going back and querying applications for information. Uh, instead, we use a push model where the application pushes a serialized, well, full accessibility tree up front and then incremental tree updates after that uh, through the compositor and ultimately to the assistive technologies. Just a moment. So why use a push model? Well, first of all, it minimizes latency because if an, applica if an application um, changes something in the user interface that uh, 
requires, that the assistive technology needs to know about, then instead of just emitting an event and then requiring the assistive technology to come back and query for more information, the application pushes a whole update to the accessibility tree. So everything that the assistive technology needs to know about what changed is, is sent in that one push. And so it's, it's as low latency as you can have. And for user, when, when a user issues a command to the screen reader or other assistive technology, then all of the information that the AT needs to respond to that command by you know, looking at what, what uh, is currently on the screen, in effect, is already there in its current in-memory snapshot of the accessibility tree based on all of those updates that have been pushed. This approach is also more resilient to hung applications or just the main thread being busy because, again, uh, just like a sighted person still has access to whatever was last drawn on the screen, the assistive technology has access to whatever was pushed in the, well, cumulatively all of the tree updates so far, possibly. The approach has been proven in the internal IPC that's happening within Chromium and Firefox. As you may know, these browsers use multi-process architectures. Um, for various reasons, the current platform accessibility APIs, such as Windows UI Automation or AtSpy, um, have to be implemented in the main uh, trusted browser process, not the sandboxed renderer process. But the main browser process can't do or can't practically do synchronous IPC round trips with the renderer process to gather the information that it needs to implement that accessibility API. So what the browsers started doing, oh, well over 10 years ago now in the case of Chrome, more recently with Firefox, is that the renderer process pushes a full accessibility tree and then incremental tree updates after that so that the main process already has all of the information that it needs to synchronously implement those accessibility APIs. So what Newton is doing now is essentially um, extending that push model from the application, not just within a, a multi-process application like a browser, but now extending it from the application all the way to the AT, the assistive technology. So there are some drawbacks. Um, obviously, I don't believe they're insurmountable drawbacks because I am uh, pushing ahead, if you'll pardon the pun, with this model. Um, but uh, the, the big drawback being the, uh, the performance for large documents. Um, you can't just do the, uh, the night, at least for some, beyond some size cutoff, which is still yet to be determined uh, for Newton. Um, you can't just do the naive thing of pushing the whole document at once. And I'll be happy to discuss that and other challenges in, in more detail later uh, uh, after, uh, outside of the presentation. But this approach does enable some, some new possibilities for accessibility that I find exciting, and I will talk about those a bit uh, later in this presentation. So let me give a few high-level design goals of Newton. First of all, it has no impact on performance and negligible impact on memory usage if no assistive technology is running. So um, there's, there's going to be some performance impact of, of serializing and pushing these accessibility trees and updates, but that only happens if an assistive technology is actually running. And by the way, if a user temporarily starts a screen reader or other assistive technology and then later stops it, um, the application or UI toolkit will find out about that so it can uh, shut down its accessibility implementation until, um, until a screen reader or AT is started again, if it is. The compositor is the final source of truth. Um, one example of that is that, as I mentioned, it's the compositor that tells the assistive technologies which Wayland surface uh, currently has the keyboard focus, and then the, uh, the AT can go uh, request to start receiving tree updates from that surface. But uh, they don't trust applications to provide global information like that. 
and uh, I'm aiming to shift as much, uh, as much complexity as possible from the applications and UI toolkits and also from the compositors uh, toward the assistive technologies and ideally into the uh, Newton AT client libraries which can be reused by multiple assistive technologies. And the, the reasoning behind this is that really it's the assistive technology developers that are most invested in getting accessibility right. So we wanna keep, keep things as simple as we can for the developers of the applications and the toolkits and the compositors and make it, uh, make it easy for them to give us accessibility developers what we need to do our job. So Newton builds on top of my other big open source project uh, called Access Kit. It's cross-platform UI accessibility infrastructure. Um, it, it provides a, a, a cross-platform abstraction over the, the, sh the concepts that are shared across all of these different accessibility APIs. And Access Kit is written in Rust, but can also be used from other programming languages. So far, we have C and Python bindings. It already has backends for Windows, Mac OS, and of course, um, AtSpy. So Newton is going to be a new backend within Access Kit for the, uh, the UI toolkit side of, of that architecture. And Access Kit already internally uses the push model with, serialized, with a serializable structure that we call the tree update. Um, there's no actual serialization going on if you're just using Access Kit with one of these existing platform backends. But it's as if I designed Access Kit from the start with something like Newton in mind, and that's because I did. I've been wanting to do a project like this Newton uh, overhaul of free desktop accessibility since I started working on Access Kit almost three years ago. So let me give an overview of the current status of the Newton project. The protocols aren't finalized yet. Um, we have uh, two protocols right now. We have a Wayland protocol, which applications or their UI toolkits use to, uh, to push these accessibility trees and tree updates to the compositor. And then we have another protocol, uh, currently DBUS based, that um, assistive technologies use to connect to the compositor and get those tree updates from it. And uh, these protocols aren't finalized yet. And in particular, we haven't made a final decision on which uh, serialization format we're gonna use for the access kit tree updates. Um, I'm currently using JSON just for ease of prototyping, but that is by no means a final decision. I have prototype implementations now in access kit, that's the UI toolkit side, Mutter, which is the basis of GNOME Shell, that's the compositor side, and Orca, the screen reader. I, um, it's possible now to demo and the whole stack end-to-end -end, um, using some Rust GUI toolkits that implement Access Kit, and particularly any GUI toolkit that implements Access Kit and uses the Access Kit WinIt adapter is, is easy to use with the current Newton prototype. And I'm currently working on integrating Access Kit into GTK, which of course is the primary UI toolkit of GNOME. And that also means that as a byproduct, GTK applications will become accessible on Windows and Mac OS for the first time. So what's next for this project? Well, first of all, I need to finish the GTK integration so we can start testing this whole thing with real world applications um, and particular real GNOME applications. Once we do that, we can start measuring the performance of the whole system with real applications, including cases like the large text documents that I was mentioning earlier, and then we can work on optimizations where needed. We're not gonna do premature optimizations, of course. We're gonna find out where we actually need to optimize. Um, we need to implement this, uh, this new architecture for the UI within GNOME Shell itself, 
as you may know, the GNOME shell UI is running in the same process as the Mutter compositor, so the, the shell UI itself isn't actually using Wayland to connect to the compositor, so we'll uh, probably do just a, an internal API within uh, Mutter for that. Then we need to finalize the protocols. That's going to involve a bunch of review and probably uh, discussions and negotiations with all of the uh, involved stakeholders, um, compositor developers, toolkit developers, and um, I should note that I personally want to make sure that uh, developers from other desktop environments are included in this um, as we work to finalize the protocols. Then once we're done with that, we can merge the code into upstream projects such as Mutter, GTK, and um, the Orca screen reader and other assistive technologies. And then finally, we need to make sure that this whole thing is documented so that uh, other developers of compositors and UI toolkits can, uh, can implement it, and just so that uh, uh, other developers can carry on uh, the maintenance and ongoing development so this project doesn't have a bust factor of one. So at this point, some of you might be thinking, show me the code. I won't link to all of the Git repositories here, but I'll give you a couple of entry points. Uh, the, uh, the best way to, uh, to, to start exploring the whole stack and to, uh, to, to build it and, and test it out is using um, my branch of the Orca screen reader, which I've linked to here. And uh, the readme in that branch includes instructions for setting up everything and testing what we've got so far. I'll also provide a link to my branch of GTK where I'm currently working on integrating Access Kit. Um, looking ahead, I, I just realized how, how I'm doing on time, so I'm gonna run through these very quickly. Um, so a couple of new possibilities that I think are pretty exciting. Accessible remote desktop using protocols such as VNC or RDP or any of the proprietary solutions um, without requiring the other, the, the remote user or the other side of the connection to run an assistive technology such as a screen reader. And for me, the, the even more exciting one is accessible screenshots or screencasts without the creator of the image or the person that's running the screencast having to do anything special because the accessibility trees from these things can just be uh, included in the image or pushed along with the screencast. So in conclusion, the Newton project is aiming to provide the overhaul that I think that uh, accessibility in free desktop environments has needed for a little while now. And beyond that, we can advance the state of the art in accessibility, not just compared to what we already have in free desktops like GNOME, but even compared to what we have in the major proprietary platforms. So a couple of special thanks. This work is being funded by the Sovereign Tech Fund, STF, who's funding um, a lot of great work across the GNOME project, not just in accessibility. And I'd also like to thank the GNOME Foundation for coordinating all of this work and setting up the contracts with people like me that are doing the work. And there is my email address and my Mastodon ID. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, but uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Hi Matt. Um, curious, you know, I didn't I didn't see any mention of timelines in there. If um, if people are wondering in terms of GNOME releases or years or months, any idea? Ah, good question. So um, my own current contract goes through the end of June this year, but um, I I just don't know yet. Um, I don't well. 
it probably won't drop in time for GNOME 47. Uh, and also, GNOME 46 was just released, like, last month. Um, probably won't drop in time for GNOME 47, but uh, maybe in time for GNOME 48 um, a year from now. Um, I, but uh, I, I can't make any promises on that, but, uh, I mean... I'm obviously I'm I'm trying to move forward as fast as I can within the next couple of months that I that I've got left on this current contract and then beyond that we'll see what happens. Hello, hello. I'm Alejandro Pinheiro from Igalia. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for all this work, especially because, as you said, one of the problems of GNOME uh, accessibility was that uh, was under uh, that. As you say, probably there are two people actively working on that, that is Jean-Marie and, and my course. Um, so I have a lot of questions, but I will try to just make three. The first one is that, um, if I understand correctly, uh, the plan for, from this is not implementing, so implementing the architecture, but not implementing a new uh, screen reader. So reusing Orca, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So the plan, and and uh, I didn't I didn't go into a lot of detail about the um, client libraries that uh, that we're providing for ATs. But uh, one of the things that I've already done some work on is a library that more or less emulates the current um, ATSPI client side API on top of the new architecture, so that um, Orca. And possibly other ATs as well can tran can can start implementing support for this as I've done on my existing branch of Orca. Okay, and now um, this is a question about the push model. Um, just to understand that, because uh, a lot of years ago, uh, one of the problems that you pointed uh, is was this uh, the chat the IPC, and the, the the sample then was about the tributes and applications that, for example, these applications that. And when you inserted a SD card with a lot of songs, then uh, it was uh, uh, the, um, the application that was uh, analyzing the SD cards started to add songs and songs and songs. So you started to get events and events and events about new songs. At that point, we were thinking that one option would be that the AT SPI or on the application try to um, accumulate or pack events and just send, uh, you know, packs of big events with all the information that you needed. So I don't know if that is exactly what you mean with the pass uh, model, or is this any difference? Um, it, it does. It does sound like we're uh, we're we're aiming for pretty much the same thing here, and I I would be happy to discuss uh, discuss that further um, outside this room. Yeah, the, the problem that we had at that time is that. Uh, is, as we didn't have too much people, we have a lot of ideas to implement, but in the end, with so little time to implement things, we were always focusing on small things to fix. Uh, uh, one on on just one. keeping uh, it barely working, right? <laughs> yeah, it's what I call the Feynman model. Instead of, uh, you know, having something... Uh, I mean, one of the things that I agree with, with your presentation, if, and if one of the things that I thank for this, is that... Um, the architecture of the GNOME accessibility, or Linux in general, because in the end, the, the architecture of GNOME accessibility is was the, the, the architecture for all the Linux environment, is that it needs a total um, 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 you know, Why don't we continue this conversation later? Yeah, yeah, probably. Sorry, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, thank you. Any other questions in the room? Yeah, I see one here. Thanks. Hi, Matt. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm Kevin from Futureway. Uh, Hi. We're working on a kind of a new UI toolkit in Rust, and uh, one of I the... have heard about you from okay. Rafe Levine. Yeah, I, that's actually. <laughs> we'll talk more offline, but that's yeah. actually why I'm here. Uh, so I was wondering if you know, if uh, from the perspective of someone who really cares about accessibility, if there's anything that new UI toolkits can do in particular from like a structural or a design standpoint to better cater to the needs of something like Access Kit, which we do plan to use. Let me think about that. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can talk more offline. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? 
Oh, one more. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm very new to desktop programming, so this has been a lot to learn. So I apologize if this is a new question, but coming from the web space, there's a lot of talk about uh, accessibility and what developers can do there, things like semantic HTML and area tags and such. I'm not as well versed in uh, desktop programming, though. How does thinking, when you're using a UI toolkit, something like GDK, how much work ends up being on the developer's side in designing their apps well, or is it uh, almost all handled well by a toolkit? Um, I think it depends on the toolkit, and what I've, what I've observed anecdotally is that uh, Apple developers using, using Cocoa and UIKit um, seem to have the least amount of work that they need to do. And, and you know, the, for the most part, things are, are handled by the toolkit with the developers only having to do simple things like labeling uh, images 